Part Twenty, Chapters Seventeen and Eighteen of Book Two of Volume Two of Democracy in America by Alexis de Tocqueville, translated by Henry Reeve. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 17 That in times marked by equality of conditions and skeptical opinions, it is important to remove to a distance the objects of human actions. In the ages of faith, the final end of life is placed beyond life. The men of those ages, therefore naturally, and in a manner involuntarily, accustomed themselves to fix their gaze for a long course of years on some immovable object towards which they are constantly tending, and they learn by insensible degrees to oppress a multitude of petty passing desires, in order to be better able to content that great and lasting desire which possesses them. When these same men engage in the affairs of this world, the same habits may be traced in their conduct. They are apt to set up some general and certain aim and end to their actions here below, towards which all their efforts are directed. They do not turn from day to day to chase some novel object of desire, but they have settled designs which they never weary of pursuing. This explains why religious nations have so often achieved such lasting results, for whilst they are thinking only of the other world, they have found out the great secret of success in this. Religions give men a general habit of conducting themselves with a view to futurity. In this respect, they are not less useful to happiness in this life than to felicity hereafter, and this is one of their chief political characteristics. But in proportion as the light of faith grows dim, the range of man's sight is circumscribed, as if the end and aim of human actions appeared every day to be more within his reach. When men have once allowed themselves to think no more of what is to befall them after life, they readily lapse into that complete and brutal indifference to futurity, which is but too conformable to some propensities of mankind. As soon as they have lost the habit of placing their chief hopes upon remote events, they naturally seek to gratify without delay their smallest desires. And no sooner do they despair of living forever than they are disposed to act as if they were to exist but for a single day. In skeptical ages it is always therefore to be feared that men may perpetually give way to their daily casual desires and that, wholly renouncing whatever cannot be acquired without protracted effort, they may establish nothing great, permanent, and calm. If the social condition of a people, under these circumstances, becomes democratic, the danger which I here point out is thereby increased. When everyone is constantly striving to change his position, when an immense field for competition is thrown open to all, when wealth is amassed or dissipated in the shortest possible space of time amidst the turmoil of democracy, visions of sudden and easy fortunes, of great possessions easily won and lost, of chance under all of its forms, haunt the minds. The instability of society itself fosters the natural instability of man's desires. In the midst of these perpetual fluctuations of his lot, the present grows upon his mind, until it conceals futurity from his sight, and his looks go no further than the morrow. 
In those countries in which unhappily irreligion and democracy coexist, the most important duty of philosophers and of those in power is to be always striving to place the objects of human actions far beyond man's immediate range. Circumscribed by the character of his country and his age, the moralist must learn to vindicate his principles in that position. He must constantly endeavor to show his contemporaries that, even in the midst of the perpetual commotion around them, it is easier than they think to conceive and to execute protracted undertakings. He must teach them that, although the aspect of mankind may have changed, the methods by which men may provide for their prosperity in this world are still the same, that amongst democratic nations, as well as elsewhere, it is only by resisting a thousand petty selfish passions of the hour that the general and unquenchable passion for happiness can be satisfied. The task of those in power is not less clearly marked out. At all times it is important that those who govern nations should act with a view towards the future. But this is even more necessary in democratic and skeptical ages than in any others. By acting thus, the leading men of democracies not only make the public affairs prosperous, but they also teach private individuals, by their example, the art of managing private concerns. Above all, they must strive as much as possible to banish chance from the sphere of politics. The sudden and undeserved promotion of a courtier produces only a transient impression in an aristocratic country, because the aggregate institutions and opinions of the nation habitually compel men to advance slowly in tracks which they cannot get out of. But nothing is more pernicious than a similar instance of favor exhibited to the eyes of a democratic people. They give the last impulse to the public mind in a direction where everything hurries it onwards. At times of skepticism and equality more especially, the favor of the people or of the prince, which chance may confer or chance withhold, ought never stand in lieu of attainment or services. It is desirable that every advancement should there appear to be the result of some effort, so that no greatness should be of too easy acquirement, and that ambition should be obliged to fix its gaze long upon an object before it is gratified. Governments must apply themselves to restore to men that love of the future which religion and the state of society no longer inspire them, and, without saying so, they must practically teach the community day by day that wealth, fame, and power are the rewards of labor, that great success stands at the utmost range of long desires, and that nothing lasting is obtained but what is obtained by toil. When men have accustomed themselves to foresee from afar what is likely to befall in the world and to feed upon hopes, they can hardly confine their minds within the precise circumference of life, and they are ready to break the boundary and cast their looks beyond. I do not doubt that by training the members of a community to think of their future condition in this world, they would be gradually and unconsciously brought nearer to religious convictions. Thus, the means which allow men up to a certain point to go without religion, are perhaps, after all, the only means we still possess for bringing mankind back, by a long and roundabout path, to a state of faith. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 That amongst the Americans all honest callings are honorable. Amongst a democratic people, where there is no hereditary wealth, every man works to earn a living, or has worked, or is born of parents who have worked. 
the notion of labor is therefore presented to the mind on every side as the necessary natural and honest condition of human existence not only is labor not dishonorable amongst such a people but it is held in honor the prejudice is not against it but in its favor in the united states a wealthy man thinks that he owes it to public opinion to devote his leisure to some kind of industrial or commercial pursuit or to public business he would think himself in bad repute if he employed his life solely in living it is for the purpose of escaping this obligation to work that so many rich americans come to europe where they find some scattered remains of aristocratic society amongst which idleness is still held in honor equality of conditions not only ennobles the notion of labor in men's estimation but it raises the notion of labor as a source of profit in aristocracies it is not exactly labor that is despised but labor with a view to profit labor is honorific in itself when it is undertaken at the sole bidding of ambition or of virtue yet in aristocratic society it constantly happens that he who works for honor is not insensible to the attractions of profit but these two desires only intermingle in the innermost depths of his soul he carefully hides from every eye the point at which they join he would fain conceal it from himself in aristocratic countries there are few public officers who do not affect to serve their country without interested motives their salary is an incident of which they think but little and of which they always affect not to think at all thus the notion of profit is kept distinct from that of labor however they may be united in point of fact they are not thought of together in democratic communities these two notions are on the contrary always palpably united as the desire of well-being is universal as fortunes are slender or fluctuating as every one wants either to increase his own resources or to provide fresh ones for his progeny men clearly see that it is profit which if not wholly at least partially leads them to work even those who are principally actuated by the love of fame are necessarily made familiar with the thought that they are not exclusively actuated by that motive and they discover that the desire of getting a living is mingled in their minds with the desire of making life illustrious as soon as on one hand labor is held by the whole community to be an honorable necessity of man's condition and on the other as soon as labor is always ostensibly performed wholly or in part for the purposes of earning remuneration the immense interval which separated different callings in aristocratic society disappears if they are not all alike all at least have one feature in common no profession exists in which men do not work for money and the remuneration which is common to them all gives them all an air of resemblance this serves to explain the opinions which americans entertain with respect to different callings in america no one is degraded because he works for everyone about him works also nor is anyone humiliated by the notion of receiving pay for the president of the united states also works for pay he is paid for commanding other men for obeying orders in the united states professions are more or less laborious more or less profitable but they are never either high or low every honest calling is honorable End of chapter 18 End of part 20 This has been a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. This reading was done by Ralph Volpe.